Watching BBC Newsroom Live, it's 11am. These are the main stories this morning. One of the best known figures in motor racing, Nicky Lauda, has died at the age of 70. His family said the three time Formula One world champion passed away peacefully. Tributes have come in from around the world. British Formula One, form, former Formula One champion Jensen Button called Lauda a legend, while the McLaren team said he would be enshrined in our history. Good morning. Welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. I'm Joanna Gosling. Tributes have been paid to the three-time Formula One world champion Nicky Lauda, who has died at the age of 70. The Austrian driver, who had a lung transplant last year, famously made a remarkable return to racing just 40 days after he was badly burned in a crash in 1976. In a statement, his family said he was a benchmark for all of us. Joe Wilson looks back on his life. Nicky Lauda excelled and somehow survived in a desperately dangerous era. He defied his wealthy family's orders to be a racing driver. With Ferrari, Lauda dominated Formula One. Already world champion in 1975, more glory seemed certain. This was his car at the 1976 German Grand Prix. Other drivers had rescued him from the wreckage. This was Lauda six weeks later, wounds barely healed, but ready to race again. He'd heard the doctors predict he'd die from lung damage. He'd implored himself to fight. When that feeling came, you get a big fright. You know, you're really worried and frightened that you're going to die. And then that means you start everything possible to keep you going. And you can't start your body because the body doesn't react. You only can start the brain. That means you hear voices, you ask why is, you know, for example, names. Why is he here and why is he not here, you know? And, Things just to keep, to keep the, the brain working, and when the brain works, the body starts to work sooner or later. In 1977, he was world champion again. The championship was Lauda's. Fourth place at Watkins Glen in the autumn was enough to regain the world title. A staggering feat, acknowledged when the BBC reviewed the sporting year. Regaining the Drivers World Championship only 14 months after his crash in Germany, Nicky Lauda wins the BBC trophy for the Outstanding Overseas Personality of the Year. Lauda was champion driver again in 1984, a victory for McLaren to go with the two titles that he won for Ferrari. Later, he held managerial roles in Formula One, notably at Mercedes. Nicky Lauda lived to inspire new generations in the sport which so nearly claimed his life decades before. The world of motorsport has been paying tribute to Nicky Lauda on social media. The former MotoGP motorcycle champion Casey Stoner has tweeted, RIP Nicky Lauda, a true icon, a motorsport legend. Thoughts are with his family and loved ones at this time. McLaren Motorsport said all at McLaren are deeply saddened to learn that our friend, colleague and 1984 Formula One world champion Nicky Lauda has passed away. Nicky will forever be in our hearts and enshrined in our history. And the former Formula One champion Jensen Button has simply tweeted, a legend has left us, rest in peace, Nicky. One of the many who've been paying tribute is former racing driver John Watson, who was Nicky Lauda's teammate at McLaren. Many, many people in the pit lane and, and around motor racing in general will have remembered Nicky. There will have been a part 
of that era of the 70s and the early 80s, mid 80s, when Nicky was winning those three world championships. And again, another great driver, another legend of the sport will no longer be able to join us in future Grand Prix in the paddock. And I, I'm personally very sad because I've lost somebody who I called a friend. And I think likewise, he would have called me his friend. Well, let's talk now to Andrew Vandervert, editor-in-chief of Autosport magazine. Thank you very much for joining us. Watching that footage of Nicky Lauda just makes your heart ache, doesn't it, with admiration at, at who he was and what he, what he did, what he went through and, and how stoic he was. Yeah, I mean, there's no one else that has a story quite like Nicky Lauda's. Uh, what he went through coming back from that horrendous crash at the Nürburgring. Ben just abruptly walking away from the sport after he'd won a second world title, only to return and then win it again. I mean, he, he transcended a couple of eras, uh, you know, from the, the time when Cosworth DFBs ruled the roost and he was there in his Ferrari to the really powerful turbo cars. And then, of course, what a final legacy with Mercedes and winning all those championships with Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg. He, truly one of a kind. And you met him, I know, on many occasions over the course of, of your work. What was he like when he was with you? Yeah, so um, I started off my career working for Jaguar Racing when, uh, when he came in as the boss of the Premier Performance Division, as, as it was known then. And uh, one thing you were never uh, short of with Nicky was the bluntness of his opinion. You know, he, was, he never left any ambiguity, so you always knew what he felt. And he made a famous comment when he was there that a monkey could drive a modern Formula One car. So they put him to his word, and I was there when he tested it. He tested the Jaguar F1 car in 2002 and spun it uh, and was, you know, uh, pretty uh, <laughs> embarrassed by what happened there, but it's, he's still stuck by his word that uh, the modern cars were more easy to drive. So straight talking, but Absolutely. with a heart? Oh, very much so. I mean, he, he was deeply passionate about motorsport and, and bringing young drivers through. His son, Mateus, is a successful driver in GT racing now. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a real character in the paddock. And, and one link back to the old days, we recently celebrated the 1000th Grand Prix, but there really isn't that link back to that time in the 70s when it was arguably the most dangerous sport in the world, um, certainly compared to what it's like now. I mean, obviously, motor racing, as with any sport, has real dedicated fans who know every detail of the sport. But Nicky Lauder is one of those people that transcends the sport and people who aren't necessarily fascinated by all the detail of motorsport will, will know the name and, and may well be familiar with the story, not least because of uh, the James Hunt film Rush, which, which sort of showed him to a new audience who might not have, have known previously quite what it is that he achieved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that battle with Hunt, I mean, also it was the first time when they used satellite broadcasting, so you could watch that uh, amazing finale from Japan live on TV, and that sort of brought him into the homes of millions of people around the world, and obviously that distinctive look uh, that he had. I interviewed him last year, and there was a series of questions from people in the paddock, and someone asked him, um, what would your life be like if you still had two ears? And he went, no one would recognise me. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Andrew van der Bert from Autosport magazine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there are many more tributes to Nicky Lauda online as well on the BBC News website. Um, as you've been hearing, Formula One legend Nicky Lauda has died at the age of 70. Yeah, I've been um, paying tribute to him at some lovely memories uh, this morning on the programme. The Austrian was world champion on three occasions. Someone who raced against him is the former F1 driver Derek Warwick. Delighted to say he joins us on the telephone this morning. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for coming on, on BBC Breakfast. Tell us a bit about uh, Nicky Lauda as a, as a man both off and off the, on and off the track. Um, Nicky was... Um very driven, um, very intelligent. Um, he didn't mess around with uh, people he didn't like. He, he, he told them straight up. Um, he had his own opinion on everything. Um, he, he knew exactly what he wanted from the team. Um, he was a loving father. Um, and he was one of the few characters left in Formula One. <clears throat> if you wanted, um, a, let's say, a controversial uh, answer to something that went on during the day of a Grand Prix, uh, nine times out of ten the television would rush for, for Nicky uh, because he told it as it was. Whether it hurt his own team or not, he wasn't political, he just told everybody what it was. He was a, a great man. Uh, anybody that come back from that horrific accident in 76 at Nürburgring uh, still, to still challenge 
uh, James Hunt um, in Japan at the end of 86 um, is a true legend of our sport. You said he was driven, and I, just with reference to that crash in Germany in 1976, what is amazing about that is that he suffered third-degree burns to his head and his yeah. face. He was actually given last rites in hospital, wasn't he? And then 40 days later, he finished fourth in the Italian Grand Prix. Yeah, he, he missed two races. He had his last rites. They didn't think he would get through later in the night, but for the, through, the, uh, through the week. Uh, but he did. Um, and like you say, he come back at, uh, at Monza. Um, Ferrari had already put somebody into his car because they didn't think he would make it. But with blood coming from his, his, his ears, his face, his head, um, he put his helmet on, and we can only imagine what that was like, um, and finished fourth. I mean, a true, true, strong competitor um, and legend of our sport. How do you think it will affect uh, Mercedes and the sport more generally? Because he was a, he was a non-executive chairman of, of their Formula One team, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he was an advisor, basically. Um, he advised the team uh, with, uh, uh, with um, Toto Wolff and people like that um, what to do and how to do it. But he left it to them to do it. He knew that um, he only had so much influence in the team, um, but the Mercedes um, board wanted him there, overlooking, seeing what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I think they won't miss him technically. But for sure they will miss him as a friend and somebody that's guided them um, to these five, six world championships that they've had. Um, sure, he's going to be missed, um, but I think he's going to be missed by the love and warmth that um, he would uh, always make sure he gave everybody. Yeah, there's some lovely tributes coming through this morning, Derek, and everyone talking about the fact that um, you know, he, would, he would have a lovely conversation with you off the track, but he was a fearsome competitor on it. Yeah, well, I knew that because obviously I raced with him um, in the early 80s um, and came across him a few times. Uh, and um, he was fierce, but he was fair. You know, he wasn't dangerous. He wasn't one of the dangerous drivers, but you knew that if you gave half a gap, he'd be, he'd be through there. So he was, he was fierce as a driver, um, but he was calculated. You know, uh, he retired twice and came back and won two more world championships, uh, three times world champion. Um, just goes to show. And I think... He was very inspirational for me because when I was uh, trying to make it in motor racing and the lower formulas, I was watching James and, uh, and Nicky, and I decided that I wanted to be Nicky. I wanted to be that, that focused, um, very ultra-fit um, person um, that um, got what he wanted, and, and that's what I tried to do in my career. Oh, so a lovely tribute, Derek. And just quickly, you mentioned uh, James Hunt there, because obviously the, the film that many people have seen portrayed them as sort of fierce rivals, but they're actually quite good friends, weren't they? Uh, behind the scenes, it the seems they were very good friends. And if you believe that film, and I thought it was very interesting when uh, one of the journalists had a real go at, at uh, James, um, Nicky um, floored him in the stairwell. So I, I, even if it wasn't true, I want to hold on to that story because I think... Behind the scenes, all us drivers um, are friends. Uh, we're just not friends on the track. Exactly, because you appreciate what you all go through. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Derek Warwick there, um, who raced against Nicky Lauda back in the 1980s with his memories of uh, the great man who, three-time world champion, who, as we've been telling you this morning, uh, died uh, yesterday uh, at the age of 70. Hello, everyone. This is Afternoon Live. I'm Simon McCoy. The world of sport is mourning the death of the legendary three-time Formula One world champion Nicky Lauda, who's died at the age of 70. The Austrian made one of the greatest comebacks in the history of sport when he returned to racing in 1976, just 40 days after being horrifically burned in a crash. His rivalry with the British driver James Hunt was legendary and made into a film. Katie Gornall looks back at his life. Nicky Lauda was a fighter on and off the track, a man who succeeded and survived in his sport's most dangerous era. He won his first world championship in 1975 with Ferrari, and more titles looked certain until this terrifying crash at the 1976 German Grand Prix. Other drivers had to rescue him from the wreckage. We got him away from the burning Ferrari, got him to lay down on the racetrack, and I kneeled down and put his head on my lap. What we didn't appreciate at the time, though, was that actually all the injury that he was going to suffer much worse from was the inhalation of toxic fumes from the burning fiberglass, which then got into his lungs and, and almost, almost took his life at that stage. 
Just 40 days later, his wounds unhealed, he was back behind the wheel. He'd been read his last rites in hospital, but refused to give up. When that feeling came, you get a big fright. You know, you're really worried and frightened that you're going to die. And then that means you start everything possible to keep you going. And you can't start your body because the body doesn't react. You only can start the brain. And when the brain works, the body starts to work sooner or later. His determination to return that season was fueled by his great rivalry with British driver James Hunt. He would eventually lose his crown to his friend, but came back the following year to become world champion for a second time, a feat that was recognised by the BBC in 1977. The BBC trophy for the outstanding overseas personality of the year. Lauda would win the title again, this time with McLaren in 1984. And today his former team was one of many to pay tribute, saying, Nicky will be forever in our hearts and enshrined in our history. Former world champion Jensen Button said simply, A legend has left us. Rest in peace, Nicky. And fellow Austrian Arnold Schwarzenegger described Lauda as an icon, saying, I will miss this generous trailblazing hero with my whole heart. Later, he would return to Austria to run his airline, Lauda Air, and would go on to hold managerial roles in F1, notably at Mercedes. But his influence extended beyond the track. Today, Billy Munger revealed how Lauda helped him after his own horror crash two years ago. He had so many um, kind things to say about me, and he really um, could, I guess, relate to my situation and the determination to get back to motorsport after having a serious accident. Um, yeah, so it's, it's super sad, and motorsport's lost um, one of the true legends of the sport. The three times champion leaves a legacy in his sport like no other. Lauda lived to inspire. Well, Nico Rosberg, who worked with Lauda during his stint at Mercedes, was among those paying tribute to the driver today. Hello to all of you. So, of course, uh, extremely sad news today, um, and my thoughts are are today with, uh, with Nicky and, and of course uh, everyone from his family and especially um, his two uh, kids Max and Mia uh, who I know as well um, and yeah I mean I will always remember um, Nicky as someone who's given my life a lot so I'm very very thankful and who also was a huge inspiration to me and to, to all of us out there I think all of you as well uh, from Loan fans and Nicky Lauda fans um, first of all, with his uh, fighting instinct to never give up. I mean, I don't think there's many bigger inspirations than, than he was in that respect. Uh, for his passion as well, for his way of always bringing people back together after, after disputes. Um, and also, uh, also, I'm thankful for, for his patience that he had with us young guns um, when we were racing for him in Formula 1. And, um, yeah, so um, I, I really hope that uh, you and Nicky rest in peace and you will be missed a lot. And um, let's, uh, let's all put our thoughts out to him today and, and for the next uh, time being. So bye-bye. Uh, that was Nico Rosberg. Uh, joining me now, Keith Collentine, editor of racefans.net. That's a motorsports website. And I, I, we, we use that word legend an awful lot, but in this particular sport, in fact, in the world of sport, it's absolutely apt, isn't it? I can think of no one it applies to better than uh, Nicky Lauda. And, and as you just heard, some of the you know, tremendous achievements that he had, it, it's not just a question of boiling someone down to three world championships and, and 25 wins. It's the manner in which he went about that and the achievements that he made on the way, bringing Ferrari back to competitiveness, the extraordinary circumstances of his comeback from that horrible crash in 1976, and then leaving the sport completely and returning in the 80s and winning another title. It's, uh, yeah, so many achievements crammed into one career. Uh, anyone who saw the film directed by Ron Howard um, will, will have realized that we're talking about someone who, who had this need for speed but also a wisdom and, a, and, a, and a, an engineering knowledge that was second to none. Yet, yeah, you know, mechanical sympathy and understanding was a very key part of what made him uh, such a special driver. But also, that, that single-minded focus, that, that obviously the utter determination to win, that's, that's unquestioned in a Formula One driver. They will all go to, you know, ultimate extremes just to win. But in Lauda's case, uh, you know, his, his determination and focus, understanding what he wanted from a racing car, and completely unapologetic, you know, to the point of blunt in terms of what he would 
demand from her car. There's so many stories told about you know, the, the brutal way almost in which he talked to uh, mechanics or the, the team at Ferrari uh, when he first arrived there and, w and was completely uncompromising in, in terms of demanding the very, very best from his uh, machinery. And that went on again into his time at McLaren. I mean, he was instrumental in bringing forward McLaren's development of their turbo-powered car in the early 80s, which paid off hugely for him and, and helped him win his final title in 1984. Keith, we've only just been marking 30 years since the death of Ayrton Senna, and I, we've been talking about that was a different time in motorsport. And Nicky Lauda came from a time, and, and, and he accepted at the time that it was a very, very dangerous sport. He did accept it to a point, but you also have to keep in mind that he worked very, very hard to draw attention to the, the problems with safety at the time he was racing. I mean, for example, in the run-up to that crash at the Nürburgring, uh, he was among those lobbying saying, you know, we can't race at this track anymore. It's 40 miles long, lined by barriers, far too dangerous. And a lot of fans at the time vilified him for that. So he took a stand against sa for, for safety then. And then when Senna was killed uh, 25 years ago in, uh, in 1994, along with Roland Ratzenberger, uh, Lauda was one of the uh, f uh, key people in reviving the Grand Prix Drivers Association to help lobby for better safety standards in Formula One, which has had a very clear and measurable impact in terms of improving the sport from that point of view. You use the words clear and measurable, and those words could be applied to him, because in, in a very glamorous world, that wasn't necessarily what he was about. <laughs> He was utterly frank, always. You could always rely on him for, if you know, a completely uncompromising, utterly untouched by PR <laughs> quote. He, he absolutely always gave it the straight honest as he saw it. Keith, it's really good to talk to you about him. Keith Conantine, editor of racefans.net. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're staying with the theme because tributes have been paid to the three-time Formula One world champion Nicky Lauda, who's died at the age of 70. The Austrian driver, who had a lung transplant last year, famously made a remarkable return to racing just 40 days after he was badly burned in a crash in 1976. In a statement, his family said he was a benchmark for all of us. Well, motor racing broadcaster, commentator and journalist Will Buxton joins me now from Monaco, just five days ahead of the 2019 Monaco Grand Prix. And, and I, I'm guessing there's only one subject of conversation amongst the drivers there at the moment. There, there really is. It, it's strange. We've arrived in Monaco and um, sort of physically and metaphorically, there, there are actually clouds hanging over Monaco this weekend. It's, it's grey skies uh, and really grey hearts for everybody. Nicky was sucked a part of Formula One and not just because of his history, what he'd achieved, but he was a very present part of the sport and a huge, um, had a huge part to play uh, in Mercedes' recent run uh, of success. But as you say, a three-time Formula One world champion and I think known around the world for that incredible comeback from that, that, that terrifying accident in 1976, which showed the strength of his character, the strength of, of of really of his soul and everything that he was about, which was just grit and determination and, and single-mindedness. And at the time, everybody thought he was perhaps downplaying it. It was quite clear when he wrote about it later, he knew very well how close he came to death then. Oh, he, he was read the last rites uh, in hospital. He was staring death in, in the face and somehow came back from it. It was, uh, I think, you know, we've we spoken recently about uh, Tiger Woods and, and his comebacks and, and, and you know, the great sporting comebacks. I don't believe there are many in the history of all sport to rival Tiger Woods, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, rival Nicky Lauda uh, and what happened in 1976. Now, you, you, meant, you mentioned uh, Mercedes, and uh, I've heard it said today that Lewis Hamilton is saying he would not perhaps not have gone to Mercedes if Nicky Lauda hadn't been there. He had an influence on everybody. Absolutely. He was instrumental uh, in creating that team, creating the force that they have become. Um, you know, Nicky was that kind of a character. Uh, you didn't mess with Nicky. He was a hard man, a really hard nut. Uh, but there was a sweetness to him, uh, a joviality, a wicked, naughty side as well. And people warmed to him and, 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 and they warmed, uh, he warmed to them as well. He was a, a lovely, lovely man uh, who just exuded everything that you would expect um, a multiple champion and somebody who was so revered, so loved uh, to, to be. Interesting because in, in a world of, of glamour, uh, he was perhaps at the time not perceived as the most glamorous of characters, but, but the warmth, as you say, came through. <laughs> Yeah, he, he just had this wicked sense of humour. Um, you know, I, I never knew him in the 1970s, but it was something that, that carried through all the way uh, into, his, into his career uh, as a, an elder statesman uh, of the sport, really. Just, um, I think, wickedly funny, you know, just a very naughty streak um, and someone who was, who was beloved uh, by the sport. Given that we're talking about a legend of this sport, do you think there may be anything special in Monaco this weekend? 
I think it's it's too early to tell. I mean, everyone really is still digesting this news. And as I said, he he is oh, he was. Uh, it's funny to talk about him in the past tense. A, a, a huge part of this paddock. It's not like he was a champion who who went away. He was a massive part of the Mercedes F1 team. And there are people in this paddock who are grieving uh, the loss of a very very dear friend. I think that's something that will come out in time. Whether there will be any tributes paid this weekend, I can't imagine it's a weekend that will go off without mention of of Nicky Lauda um, and we will hold in our hearts um, with with all the right reasons somebody who defined his sport at the time uh, and someone whose legend I think will define the sport for decades into the future. Well it's really good to talk to you thank you so much for your time that's Will Buxton Motri uh, broadcaster thank you so much. You're watching Afternoon Live plenty more reaction to that of course throughout the afternoon and in the five hour but let's move on to one of our other main stories the world of sport is mourning the death of the legendary three-time Formula One world champion Nicky Lauda who's died at the age of 70. The Austrian made one of the greatest comebacks in the history of sport when he returned to racing in 1976 just 40 days after being horrifically burned in a crash. His rivalry with the British driver James Hunt was legendary and in fact made into a film. Katie Gornall now looks back at his life. Nicky Lauda was a fighter on and off the track, a man who succeeded and survived in his sport's most dangerous era. He won his first world championship in 1975 with Ferrari, and more titles look certain until this terrifying crash at the 1976 German Grand Prix. Other drivers had to rescue him from the wreckage. We got him away from the burning Ferrari, got him to lay down on the racetrack, and I kneeled down and put his head on my lap. What we didn't appreciate at the time, though, was that actually all the injury that he was going to suffer much worse from was the inhalation of toxic fumes from the burning fiberglass, which then got into his lungs and, and almost, almost took his life at that stage. Just 40 days later, his wounds unhealed, he was back behind the wheel. He'd been read his last rites in hospital, but refused to give up. When that feeling came, you get a big fright. You know, you're really worried and frightened that you're going to die and then that means you start everything possible to keep you going and you can't start your body because the body doesn't react. You only can start the brain. And when the brain works, the body starts to work sooner or later. His determination to return that season was fueled by his great rivalry with British driver James Hunt. He would eventually lose his crown to his friend but came back the following year to become world champion for a second time, a feat that was recognised by the BBC in 1977 the BBC trophy for the outstanding overseas personality of the year. Lauda would win the title again, this time with McLaren in 1984. And today his former team was one of many to pay tribute, saying, Nicky will be forever in our hearts and enshrined in our history. Former world champion Jensen Button said simply, a legend has left us, rest in peace Nicky. And fellow Austrian Arnold Schwarzenegger described Lauda as an icon, saying, I will miss this generous trailblazing hero with my whole heart. Later, he would return to Austria to run his airline, Lauda Air, and would go on to hold managerial roles in F1, notably at Mercedes. But his influence extended beyond the track. Today, Billy Munger revealed how Lauda helped him after his own horror crash two years ago. He had so many um, kind things to say about me, and... He really um, could, I guess, relate to my situation and the determination to get back to motorsport after having a serious accident. Um, yeah, so it's, it's super sad and motorsport's lost um, one of the true legends of the sport. The three times champion leaves a legacy in his sport like no other. Lauda lived to inspire. Katie Gornall there with that look back at the life of Nicky Lauda. Uh, well, I'm joined now by one of the great names in Formula One history, Jody Schechter, who was world champion in 1971 on Nicky's long-term challenges because, uh, Jody, in fact, in 1977, when he won, you were second. <laughs> how, how good was he? How good was he? Um, I think his real skills were setting up the car and getting that side right. Um, and he, he was, he, they always called him, I think, the computer because he didn't bring emotion into his decisions. So, so um, from that point, he was, he was uh, from a driving point, that I think was his strong points. When you're driving in a race, there are some drivers, presumably, who you see in the mirror or at your side who are going to make you nervous. What was he like to drive against? 
Oh, no, he was absolutely... You, you had total confidence he wasn't going to do anything stupid or or um, unfair or anything like that. He was, he was one of the better drivers or one of the best drivers from that point of view. And at, at the time, the, there was the, the intense rivalry in a way perhaps at the moment we, we don't necessarily see. Uh, how did you get on with him off the track? Yeah, no, I mean, we, yeah, very well. I, I remember going to his place, um, his house one time, and we stayed over there. Yeah, he's just a straightforward, you know, nice guy. Um, uh, no BS about him, um, no exaggeration. He was, he was a straightforward guy. That crash uh, on the Nürburgring, what, what are your memories of that? Well, I was behind him at the time and then came around. I can't remember if there were flames or not, but he had gone off the track. Um, and that's all, you know, because you were going past it, whatever, 100 and whatever miles an hour. So, And then afterwards, they, they uh, uh, black flagged the track or red flagged the track. And, and then you waited for the news. And I'm not even sure if we got it that day or, you know, later. And he was back on the track within six weeks. Well, I mean, what sort of man can do that? Well, you know, he, he was physically not very strong at all, but he was mentally very, very strong. Uh, you, in, 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 in what he did, in whatever he did, in that I saw within racing, and that obviously is an extension of that. And looking back at his life now, you, the professor was a word that we used. There were other crueler words that were thrown around because in a, in a world of glamour, he was up against James Hunt a lot of the time. Uh, that wasn't a word necessarily you would have applied to him. No, I, no, he, was just, he was a straightforward, very professional, um, unemotional guy that was doing everything he could to... To, to make his car right to win the championships. And, and, and that's why he did, and that's how he did them. He won the championships. And the issue of safety was one that was close to his heart. In fact, some were criticizing him at the time because just before his crash, he'd been criticizing that circuit. Yeah, that circuit was uh, in some ways a fantastic to drive, but also it, because it was so long and there were massively fast corners, it wasn't controlled as much as a small circuit. So yes, it, wa it was dangerous from that point of view. Now, we, we are look, looking back at his driving, but of course, after he stopped doing that, he, he's been hugely influential in Formula One right up until his death. Yeah, abs absolutely. I think he's contributed a lot to the sport you know, his whole life, really. And um, yeah, in some ways, um, more so in the in the latter years. What, what do you think he brought to Formula One then? Well, his experience and his level-headed thinking without emotion, and he, you know, instilled that into the team. And uh, you know, sure, they've adapted and learned a lot from that. Finally, Jody, what, what does Formula One owe that man, Nicky Lauda? Well, I, I mean, I suppose you could say he's, he's given uh, Nicky everything he, he had in a way, and Nicky's given Formula One a massive amount. So, I, you know, it's, he was part of it, a big part of it. And so, the, if you can say it's both ways, really, I would, that's what I would think. Well, it's really good to talk to you. Jody Shetter, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Pleasure, thanks. Well, let's get more now from another three-time world champion who raced against Nicky Lauda, Sir Jackie Stewart. Evening, Sir Jackie. Thanks for joining us on Sports Day this evening. Well, uh, it's sad that it's for the reason that it is, but Nick, Nick was a great man and a great man within the sport, not just as a racing driver, but... Uh, with regards to the, um, uh, the the team, the Mercedes team, uh, he'll be very sadly missed by them and, of course, a great many other people around the world, a great Austrian, a real hero over there, and rightly so. Uh, and he was a good friend of mine. Yes, yeah, some wonderful tributes have been paid today. Um, a huge figure in the sport, it just reminds you of that. Uh, and you have called him the bravest after that, that horrendous accident that really defined his career and him as a person, I suppose. Yes, uh, it was just a huge accident. I mean, uh, it looked like a mechanical failure. Uh, he was trapped in the car. The car was on fire. It had been a high-speed accident at the same time. Uh, several drivers helped to get him out the car. Uh, he was still badly burned, but I think 
what happened there with the inhalation of toxics as well as heat um, is the cause of them now no longer being with us because great work was done to allow him to live. Uh, he died twice, I understand, uh, as I understand it at the time I was around at that period. Um, and he got jump-started twice. And here he came through it all, came back to racing probably with the most uh, brave performance I've ever seen when his head was still bleeding. He put his crash helmet on, went out at Monza and the Ferrari, did a good time, came back in, and I was there when he took his helmet off. He was bleeding badly, and he must have been in considerable discomfort and pain. And yet he he went back out again and, in fact, raced. Few people would ever have done that. Nicky was so... Nicky Wilder was so single-minded about what he was doing, um, and he really turned Ferrari around at that time to be really successful. And then, of course, he started his airline very successfully. And then he, with Total Wolf, has uh, really made a great job of Mercedes-Benz totally dominating the sport now for a good four or five years. So we're all sad, very, very sad at, at Nicky passing. But he was in great discomfort for quite a long time. Uh, because he lost both his lungs, they were replaced, and of course they, they seemingly didn't last long enough, and, and sadly we've lost them. Yeah, I mean, he'd been in very ill health, hadn't he, for a, a, a number of months. Uh, he was so influential after his racing days, you mentioned his time at Mercedes, though, uh, but in the paddock, um, helping shaping uh, so many young drivers' careers, he was influential in, in putting Lewis Hamilton on, on the current path that he's on. Yes, for sure. It was important times, uh, and his influence in the sport was very big. He was a quiet man, but when he spoke, people listened. And, uh, you know, he was a character. Um, he was the same with everyone, whether it was a monarch or whether it was a mechanic. Um, Nicky was there. Uh, Nicky, we, you know, we had good friends together. I raced against him. Um, and touring car racing, actually, to begin with. And I remember at the Nürburgring, he was driving a BMW. I was riding the Ford Cortina with Emerson Fittipaldi. It was a 12-hour, 9-hour race, I think it was. And I just couldn't keep up with him. He was hot. And that was before he got into Formula One. And then, of course, I saw him at the beginning of the Formula One era. Uh, I was, it was my last season, so he wasn't up at up at the front at that time he was just getting started but my goodness did he reach the top in a very big way so jackie stewart many thanks for sharing your memories of uh, nikki lauder who's died at the age of 70. many thanks sir jackie thank you